welcome to this evening's uh, public lecture by Professor Thomas Metzinger. Uh, my name is Venu Narayan, and I'm a member of the faculty uh, at Azim Premji University. As uh, many of you might know, uh, Azim Premji University um, is a very young university based in Bangalore. It was started in or founded in 2010. Uh, by the Azim Premji Foundation. Uh, the, universe, the foundation has been active uh, mainly in the field of rural elementary education in India for over a decade um, and has been working in various parts of the country to improve both access to and the quality of uh, education. The university is, a, is an initiative that the foundation has started out of the conviction that preparing uh, young persons uh, for work as teachers and professionals in the education and development sector is a very urgent need in the country. It's clear that we need a very new vision of education and a new vision of development. We, I don't think the foundation or the university or anybody else can claim to know what that vision should be. At the same time, it's clear that the questions around what the nature of education should be and what kind of development we should hope for so that the next few generations find a far more peaceful and sustainable society and livelihoods and um, work for themselves. That is very urgent. That seems clear to all of us. And that such a society has to be more just, more equitable and more sustainable is also fairly evident. What the connection of such a vision with questions that seem to be at the other end of the spectrum, the nature of, the nature of people, individuals and persons, the nature of, the consci of consciousness and the, the, the nature of uh, our own understanding of ourselves. That's a different set of questions that seem somewhat far away from uh, the, the social and political questions that just equitable and hum humane and sustainable societies, uh, what, what kind of places they have to be. I'm hoping that today's talk will show to us that there is uh, a strong and inescapable connection with these kind of, between these kind of questions. And there is perhaps nobody better uh, better qualified to talk about it than Professor Metzinger. He's currently Professor of Theoretical Philosophy at the Johannes Gutenberg University at Mainz and an adjunct fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Study. He's also Director of the Neuroethics Research Unit in Mainz and Director of the MIND Group at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Study. His focus of research is in analytical philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, and philosophical aspects of the neuro and cognitive sciences, as well as in connections between ethics, philosophy of mind, and anthropology. Among the many books and articles uh, he has written, uh, the book published in 2003 called Being No One, that was uh, written for a philosophical audience, he has also written, uh, published a book in 2009, which is uh, targeted at a more wider popular audience uh, called the Ego Tunnel. Uh, without uh, much further ado, I invite, I'm very happy to invite Professor Metzinger to give us this talk on all our behalf and on behalf of the Foundation and the University. Thank you. much for your uh, kind introduction and for the invitation. It's an interesting experience to be here again. I 
for the first time I came as a philosophy student, 30 years with a backpack, 30 years. Yeah? It has to go higher. Like this? No, still not. Like this? So I came to Bangalore the first time with my backpack as a student, I said 30 years ago. And it's, uh, it's amazing to see the city again uh, with a three decades distance. Um, there was less traffic at that time, but uh, I think other things are improving as well. Maybe I should, now let's see if I can do this. So in this lecture, which starts with a slide by an Indian scientist, namely Ramachandran, uh, I want to just make briefly make two points is how one can explain the robust conscious experience that you are someone without assuming that selves exist in the world and while it is why it is nevertheless false to say the self is only an illusion so the basic and as far as I'm concerned trivial claim in the background is, is that nobody in this room is a self or has a self Twelve years ago I spent a year uh, in San Diego, at UC San Diego, and that's where I also met Ramachandran. Perhaps some of you know this classical experiment in neuropsychology. I guess all of you um, know what a phantom limb is. Some patients after amputations feel a phantom limb. Typically within six weeks or so this will become shorter there may be even a point in time where according to conscious experience you can clench your fingers and make a fist in the stump and then it disappears but for some people the phantom limb never get, goes away uh, they develop a fa paralyzed phantom limb and it's a big problem for them when walking through doors or sleeping with their pillow at night and they also develop a cramping pain the phantom fingers clench into um, the bottom of the hand and that creates an interesting problem for medicine. How do you treat pain in a non-existing limb? So the idea these researchers had uh, was if you could get it under volitional control again, it might disappear with time. So here the ingenious uh, experiment was to have somebody with a paralyzed phantom limb and the task was please make symmetrical movements like this, like a butterfly with those arms, with your phantom limb and with the real arm. How do you feel? What is your conscious experience? And then the patient will say, well, doctor, what's my experience? My real arm is moving, my phantom limb is paralyzed, like the last 12 years. Then you put down a mirror in the middle and say, can you do the same thing again and look at the mirror from the right? And then the patient will exclaim, Doctor, Doctor, for the first time in 12 years I can move my phantom limb. You pull out the mirror and they are very disappointed and say, oh, it's frozen again. You do the same thing again, you put the mirror there and say, move both arms, look into the mirror from the right. And the patient say, will say, oh, my arm is plugged in again, I've got volitional control. You switch off all lights, the patient says, ah, my phantom limb is paralyzed again. What moves in that experiment is what I call a conscious self-model, a phenomenal self-model. So <clears throat> the first concept from philosophy I want to introduce is a phenomenal self. Philosophers speak about the self as it appears in conscious experience. Phenomenal means it subjectively appears to that. And what we call the phenomenal self, the consciously experienced self, is what we sometimes also simply call the ego. It is the self as it is being subjectively experienced. Now, the question one can ask is, can one scientifically explain of a phenomenal self in a nervous system, in a brain? The answer is yes, you can scientifically explain how the sense of self appears in the brain because there is no such thing as a self. The only thing you have is a PSM, a phenomenal self model, a model of the self on the level of conscious experience. And I will now take some steps to explain what a phenomenal self model is. As was mentioned, I've worked in my own theory, it's called the self-model theory of subjectivity on the human self-model for 
two, three decades. There's a theory in the background. But now I just want to explain the concept. What is a phenomenal self-model? In the first example, with the moving phantom limb, I would say this is a phenomenal self-model that got under volitional control again. So a phenomenal self-model is what philosophers also call a mental representation, an image in the mind. In our own case, it's an inner image of the person as a whole, and not only of your body in the brain, but of your psychological properties. For instance, I'm hungry right now, I'm jealous right now, I'm angry. Also including social properties. So what are my relations to other human beings? This is part of your self-model as well. Now, if one wants to describe what a self-model is, one can do it on different levels of description. One can use different logical instruments and different scientific disciplines. You can look at an elephant and some people look at the trunk and do trunk science and other people look at the tail and do tail science. And all the truths on the different levels of description, they can be truths at the same time. So let's look at this. So the human self-model, your self-model, I hope you all have a conscious self-model right now while you're listening to me, can be described on the neurobiological level of description. I'm not going to say much about this tonight, but in one sense it's of course clear it's a widely distributed activation pattern in the human brain. So your conscious self-model now, one level of describing it is as a dance of hundreds of millions of firing neurons in your brain in a certain temporal pattern. For those of you who are more scientifically interested, there will be a lecture tomorrow at 11 in the Center for Neuroscience. I will go a bit more into the details of this. But today let's be more philosophical and not talk about the brain so much. So the self-model is something in the brain. There are a lot of new facts about the human self-model in the brain. It is also possible to, to describe it on the representationalist level of description. What does that mean? It's a philosophical term, and you would say you look at a human being, at a brain, as a system that just creates representations of the world. It's a more abstract level of describing it. So then the self, your feeling of selfhood, would be a content, a representational content in consciousness. So here are two examples of how people imagine this today. In 1995, I published a book on conscious experience. There was this photo by a brain researcher, John Allman, on the front. So what they did is he looked at a brain, and then they did a brain scan of what is happening in his brain and superimposed it on the photo. What you don't see so well is, is that there's a little red dot an area of very high activity back in the visual cortex and intuitively that would be the representation of the seen brain in the seen brain, the model the brain creates of the seen brain. Another way people today look at this is that when you see a dog there is an outside object, something impinges on your retina then a lot of complicated things happen back in your visual system and there would be something called the NCC, the neural correlate of the conscious experience of seeing this German Shepherd dog. And the third level is what you consciously perceive. You just see a dog out there. So the idea is there's a sensory representation that gets transformed into a conscious model of the dog and that becomes the content of your subjective experience. Now, that is another way, a second way, to look at what a self conscious self is as a content of an image. There's a conscious and an unconscious self model. Here the example is psychosomatic diseases. Most of our self-representation, most of the things we believe about ourselves are unconscious. But if a trauma enters, it enters on the level of the conscious self model. So somebody might come and say, you put on weight again? Um, it's not going well with your girlfriend, is it? 
we don't see you together lately. Um, what about that promotion? Uh, and it traumatizes you. It hurts you emotionally on the level of your emotional self model. And what you will do is you put push the information down into your unconscious self model. So you don't have to experience the hurt anymore, but the information is still there in your unconscious self representation. I'm too fat. Uh, people don't like me. Whatever it is. Now, because the self model is anchored in the brain, because it is ultimately a physical process, this will have all kinds of effects, causal effects, for instance, on your immune system. It might make you more susceptible to infections or even to cancer cells the immune system doesn't care. So, psychosomatic diseases is a very strange concept if you think about it. People work on it, but it's not clear what that relation should be between psyche and soma. This theory says psychosomatic diseases are relationships, causal interactions between the conscious and the unconscious self-model. Now, very obviously, the human self-model changes through learning processes and maybe there is an inborn core. Maybe there's something <coughs> that is innate when you are born as a baby. Obviously, your sense of self changes. You have no memory of a sense of self before two years. There's no autobiographical memory. When you get very old and old age dementia, you may lose it. And it acquires experiences. So in five minutes, I'll give you an example for what it means that there's maybe an innate core to the human self model. But let's move on and get a richer picture. The human self model also possesses a true evolutionary description. We are not the only animals on this planet that have self models. Very obviously, the ego self consciousness has a long evolutionary history on this planet. It was something that was invented by evolution. So, two examples and then a neuro very unromantic description. A body model is something that should have been accurate, right? It was good for animals in, in our distant biological part to have a very past, to have a very good image of their own body. How strong am I really? Can I fight this guy? How fast am I really? Can I get away? How far can I jump from one branch to the next branch? How heavy am I? Will this branch, will I fall down? Will the branch break? So it's, it's very obvious that for animals it was good to have a body model in their brain, um, to know what their properties are, where their boundaries are, <coughs> and so forth. But it, I'm just, we can come back to this in the discussion, but a very interesting point in latest research is that a self model is also something that is advantages because you can successfully self-deceive yourself. So the body model would better be accurate. But as it turns out, evolution also invented optimism. So one of the strongest biases human beings have is called optimism bias. They have unjustifiable opinions about how many good experiences are awaiting them in the future. Uh, and I could now go on for two days and give you examples of self-deception. Um, the strongest source, statistically, if you take the research, is male overconfidence. So male overconfidence is the cause of most military and traffic catastrophes. You can show it very clearly, uh, for instance, if you look into records of wars, of invasions that the people who started the war in the beginning, the military had the opinion as a piece of cake, these idiots, we are technologically superior, we'll just walk in. And after about the fourth day of the war, you can always see records of this going a little slower than we thought, and um, it doesn't work as well. And you know, so male overconfidence in an evolutionary context was probably advantages. But for us, it creates many problems. And there are many other examples where human beings motivate themselves by deceiving themselves in, in different ways. 
So that's also what a self-model is. So a very unromantic view about the conscious self is that it was actually a weapon that was invented and optimized in a cognitive arm race. So my view, in a nutshell, is, is that we developed organs in evolution, eyes, ears, hearts, livers, but we also developed virtual organs, which are not always there. And the conscious self that pops in when you wake up in the morning is just such another thing uh, that was invented in evolution. So another level of description you could describe the self-model as an information processing event. In philosoph philosophers call this a functionalist level of description. So the general idea is, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but what exactly is happening in the moment when you wake up in the morning? The very moment, say you have been unconscious and you come to yourself and this conscious experience of I am someone I'm here and I'm now, emerges. What is that? So one metaphor would be, this is the moment when the system which you are boots its conscious self model. It's just when you boot your Windows desktop and you get a virtual reality with a waste paper bin and you are the mouse pointer. The mouse pointer that tells the system, I am here and now and here I can do something by clicking, for instance. So one way to look at the conscious self model is as a computational module that is sometimes there during waking states and during deep sleep it's not there and in the dream state is very different and the use it has is that you can regulate your interaction with the environment with the help of a conscious self model. When you wake up in the morning you can control your body as a whole. You cannot do it without self-consciousness. So if you want to run to the refrigerator, you need a conscious self. Uh, else you will just be a paralyzed organism in bed. So if that is true, it should be possible to have non-biological systems, uh, machines with self-models as well. I have as a philosopher, and I must maybe say this, I'm a very strange philosopher. Made many people hate me in my own country because I've always thought philosophers should interact with scientists. So I've interacted a lot with neuroscientists or with artificial intelligence people. And many years ago I've said um, that artificial intelligence will never get anywhere if those systems don't have self-models. Uh, you know, extended spatial self-models, but that at the same time we shouldn't do that because things get very dangerous, I think, if we have machines with self-models. Still, I was very happy when in 2006 uh, these people in Cornell University <coughs> actually did what I always asked for. This robot is called a starfish. It's a four-legged walking machine and it has a self-model. So how do they do this? Uh, they have this robot and here you see images of its walking and the robot has a soul. And the robot's soul is a model of its own body. And you can see how this, the self-model, the graphic spatial representation goes along with uh, the machine. And then these scientists are very cruel. As soon as the thing has learned to walk using his, its little self, they cut off one of its arms. See? They chop off an arm. And the interesting property the system has is it changes its self-model. It learns, I have lost an effector, I have lost a limb and can develop a new way of walking, limping. Now learning to limp is a form of intelligence. Imagine you have one of these things on Mars and it loses a leg and it cannot do that, it's just over, the mission is over. But this system, if it has body damage on Mars, it could develop a new way of walking. And these scientists think that is a superior form of intelligence, there would be no paralyzed phantom limbs, you know. This system would learn its body has changed. Maybe I shouldn't go into the details, but this is how um, these people call their own discipline evolutionary biorobotics. So they try to mimic evolutionary processes, and this is how it works. The system starts to move like a baby, makes 
random movements, and then it dreams up self-models. How could my body look? And tries to match the sensations from the moving limbs back to the model of its body. It goes through many learning cycles and it, until it has one self-model that matches the effector data, the sensor data coming from the random movements. And then it will use this little self-model to synthesize a behavior. And here's how it looks if a machine comes to itself in that sense. might also look at what it does to you, what happens in you while you're trying to understand this. Nobody would believe that this system is conscious. It's not self-conscious. It has a self-model, it uses it, but it has no conscious self-model, right? Now, um, let us look at what a conscious self-model is. Here is some research you can do at home uh, after you come home tonight. I don't know, in India do you have dishwashing gloves? Uh, you could take a dishwashing glove and stuff it with cotton. And then, if you don't have a rubber hand, you put this rubber hand on the table in front of you and do exactly what my Swiss colleague Binya Lengenhager does here. It's called the rubber hand illusion. It was discovered in 1998. And there are now millions of variations of it, scientific, scientists. Um, um, research it in all variations. If you do that, you could also use a Q-tip and you synchronously strike the unseen hand, you have to erect a blockade, and the rubber hand in front on the table. After 20 to 90 seconds, you will feel that the rubber hand is part of your own bodily self. That is, you will develop a sense of ownership for the rubber hand. And what is even more fascinating is you will feel the seen touch in the rubber hand. You will get a conscious tactile sensation of being touched. Uh, you could do this at home, but you have to look at it. Don't look into the eyes of your friend who does it, and you don't have to giggle all the time. But, you know, uh, just let it come on and look at the hand. It's also important that the angle of the rubber hand is realistic, like it would normally be. And what one finds is if one synchronously strokes both of these hands, uh, then after 20 to 90 seconds you get this um, illusion of this is my own hand and I feel the touch in it. So you just offer a statistical correlation to the brain. From the outside, you can show what happens in premotor cortex in the uh, moment. Cette expérience, j'ai vraiment ah, ressenti. Non, non. French, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Try it out. Now, um, yes. Well, let's try this one. <laughs> Why is this scientifically important? I talked to you about a conscious and an unconscious self model. This shows uh, that. Let's see if this redoes it again. It doesn't. This shows that the unconscious brain really believes that this is your own hand. It's not some fancy or imagination or an illusion. It really embeds the model of the rubber hand into your body model. And so if you do this tonight with your friends, have a hammer ready. You know, don't tell them. As soon as they say the illusion is working, um, hit the rubber hand. Another thing you can also do is 
if it's a rubber hand and somebody has the illusion standing bent fingers backward to an impossible position and watch them, how they start to nervously laugh uh, and ask them, is it painful or not? And why are you so nervous? Uh, there are many things you can do. So <clears throat> I asked five minutes ago the question, um, could there be an inborn self model? That's an important scientific question, or do, does a baby only acquire it after birth through playing? <coughs> this is a woman, AZ, in Switzerland, a patient uh, who was a cognitively lucid academic with a PhD, and she was born without arms and legs. But she, for, since whenever she can remember, uh, she has felt phantoms, phantom limbs, uh, phantom legs and phantom arms. Now if you do careful body phenomenology, you can discover a number of interesting things as scientists in Switzerland have done. For instance, you can see that the three middle toes are not differentiated. She doesn't feel five toes. So that's what I mean by a self-model. It's not fully differentiated. Then they said, can you rate how real these phantom limbs feel on a scale from zero to <coughs> seven. Zero means no <coughs> conscious experience. Seven means it's just as real as my navel or my belly. So then you see, for instance, that there's a variance and you see that these two parts of the legs feel about half as real, you know, uh, as the so-called real physical body. The first scientist who ever wrote papers about phantom limbs spoke of ghostly members. Uh, so this is really ghostly. It's half as real according to conscious experience. But another interesting fact is the right hand is more real than the left hand. The right hand never existed. It never existed as an input source to the brain. That brain could never learn that she's right hand. So many interesting things to explain. So this is Peter Woger, the scientist who did all this research. And just to give you an idea, what I mean by that the self model is something in the brain, you could put this woman in a scanner. And you could not only say, move your left phantom fingers and your right phantom fingers. You see exactly what areas go on in the brain. But you can also do something like, take your thumb and now put touch it with the index finger, and now touch it with the middle finger, and tell us when you have the feeling of contact, and see what brain areas light up. Another thing you could do is give her conscious sensations which she never had. Once you knew where the hand areas are, you can, through a process called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, stimulate these brain areas, and she gets a conscious experience she's never had before, my hands hurt. You're hurting my finger <coughs> with, a, with a shock. You, know? you get the idea? This is what I mean by a self-model. But I'm a philosopher. So the question is, what is this self-model representing? I mean, what is this a model of? Here's an older colleague of mine, Aristotle, uh, <laughs> who said the soul is the form of the body. Um, Aristotle thought that the soul perishes at death with the physical body, but uh, like many people of his time, he thought it is the global form principle that holds the parts together. So is that what the brain of this woman is rep representing, global body shape? Here's another Western philosopher, Spinoza, many centuries later, he wrote, the soul is the idea that the body develops of itself. So somehow the sense of what I am, what my parts are, has to do with body representation and um, global representation of oneself as a whole. So now I want to tell you a bit about my own research I told you. When I came to America, I had to learn new words, I remember in San Diego. The first new English word I didn't know I had to learn was backstabbing. <laughs> the second English word I had to learn was a CLM. Do you know what a CLM is? It's a career limiting move. <laughs> uh, a career limiting move I had made was um, 
that I had written about out-of-body experiences in my books because I thought they were important scientifically. These people, Olaf Blanke, a neurologist in Switzerland, had for the first time caused out-of-body experiences with an electrode in the brain. So we met each other and I said we need to make out-of-body experiences and repeatable experiences for healthy people in the lab. And we tried to create artificial out-of-body experiences with the help of our Indian uh, computer scientist, uh, Tej Tadi, who always said, we have to go to Rishikesh, there are more subjects in Rishikesh. <laughs> uh, this is the first, the first uh, author of the study, Binya Lengenhager, and um, let me show you what we did. So I came to these people and said, I want, as a philosopher, a whole body version of the rubber hand illusion. And I said, ah, no, no, it's not possible. The brain never sees the body from the outside. And then I said something very complicated, uh, philosophical, about virtualized mental. And they said, the philosopher, it's absolutely, un wait a minute, we have a virtual reality lab. So we did something in a virtual reality lab that creates a conscious experience you haven't had before and resembles this Magritte picture of 1937. You see yourself from behind. <coughs> so we try to create full body illusions and the way we did it is that you stand there, you stand there actually, and you wear virtual reality goggles. You are filmed from a camera behind and the, there's a, a system called a 3D encoder and it inserts the image of your own body into the virtual reality. So you see a virtual room and suddenly you see yourself standing in front of you in 3D. Then the PhD student comes just like in a rubber hand illusion and strokes your back while you see your back being stroked. We stroke the back off the experimental subject. We had a camera, not in front, but in the, behind the subject, two meters behind, who was filming the stroking, and in real time projected this information to us. This is what you see. It was in front of the, the subject eye, so all the subject was seeing is the stroking, but now, at the back, while at the same time you see your own body being touched by two meters in front of you. And some of the subjects reported that they very strongly felt, um, the no, stroking, sorry, um, the subject eyes were asked, we displaced them to another position in the room, and then we asked them with eyes closed to walk back to the position. And when they were doing this, they actually did not go back to the real position, to my position right now, but rather were closer actually to where they saw the body. So, um, this is a weaker effect, much weaker than the rubber hand illusion. This doesn't work with everybody. But some people, everybody gets drawn into the avatar, into the virtual body, and some people jump into it with the sense of self. And that's, of course, extremely interesting from a philosophical perspective. And if you then, somebody who has had the illusion, you turn them around, you disorient them until they don't know where they are. And then you say, walk back to where you think you've been standing. They walk back to a place which, in average, is 24 centimeters closer to the avatar after they've had the illusion. And for many minutes, the unconscious spatial frame of reference is moved. So my official position is, I'm in this research for a number of years now, this will never work. Why will it not work? Because what I call the interceptive um, self model holds you back in the physical body, so to speak. The gut feelings, your blood sensations. Just to give you an example, this is a study that was just published two weeks ago by two uh, very bright young people in Switzerland and in England, Lukas Heidelich and Jane. <clears throat> Espel and they listened to my criticism uh, and they said, okay, we're going to do a new thing. So what the system does, the avatar you see, it's pulsating with light. <coughs> and you just look at this avatar and it has a silhouette of light. But what you don't know is that the pulsating can be synchronized to your heartbeat or not. So just as in the first experiment, if you stroke <coughs> asynchronously, you get no illusion. But if you stroke the back synchronously, you get the illusion. Same with uh, introceptive stimuli. So this is one way in which this uh, research goes. Um, and there are many variations. So this is the classical experiments. That works very well. You jump backwards. 
Swedish scientist has developed this. A very interesting thing is if you do the setup like this, some people have the feeling they float upwards, and some people have the feeling they drop downwards to the table. And today you can do very fancy things. You put the people in the fMRI scanner, and you look what is different in the brains of those people who float up, and what is different in the people who drop down, right? Um, artificial stroking, here you see your crazy philosopher. I wear something like a diving suit with sensors, 18 cameras, film me infrared cameras, and then I can move an artificial body in virtual reality. And you can control arti an artificial body. So last time I was there, during the break, I caught one of the PhD students um, who is a salsa dancer. Her, happy, her hobby is the South American dancing. <coughs> so she copies 16 body images of her into virtual reality and another 16 one on the head and then she dances salsa <coughs> with herself in virtual reality while the machine is not used. Um, <coughs> there is now a research project of which I'm a part with nine countries in Europe. It's called the Bearer Project, and that means virtual ro embodiment and robotic re-embodiment, where we try to make these effects stronger and better. So the idea is, can you simulate a sense of self, transpose it into a robot or an avatar? Is it possible? And I want to bring you one last example just to give you an idea where this <coughs> research on the conscious self is standing now, which way we are going. So this is what some ingenious people in Israel are doing. You lie in a scanner and you imagine movements. You imagine moving your right arm just with your mind. You're moving, you imagine walking. And then you have a complicated process by which you can read out through a brain-computer interface the motor intentions and the motor commands, analyze them in a computer, and send them to a robot that is 4,000 kilometers away in France over the internet. The interesting thing is that you can also wear goggles and look out of the eyes of this robot. So just look at this brief video. A subject lies down in the fMRI scanner in the Wiseman Institute of Science, in Israel. The subject imagines moving his left hand, right hand, or his feet. Our system processes the data received from the fMRI and decodes the thought patterns in near real time. So you trust that mental activities are sent over the internet to France. You are here. This is what you see through the robot's eyes. The humanoid robot in France receives the high-level commands and performs them. The subject in Israel sees the world through the eyes of the robot in France. An assistant in France gestures to the subject, suggesting the areas to explore in the room. The robot is very expensive and very fragile, so an assistant holds the robot in case it might fall over. <coughs> so this is just a proof of concept study. There are many, it's also not my own work in any way, but there are many technical difficulties. This is not real time. There's a delay in it. The scanner puts in a two second delay. But you can imagine where this will be maybe 20 years from now. Um, so this is just um, to give you an idea where research on self-consciousness, on the boundary between philosophy, neuroscience, robotics, and cognitive science is right now. Um, but don't overestimate it. On the other hand, we have some anecdotal reports. Some people, a nice thing is that you can just sit on a chair and control the robot with your thoughts. You turn the robot around and you look at yourself sitting in the chair. Where is yourself in that moment? There's some anecdotal evidence, some people who have controlled the robot with their thoughts like that. 
if the experiment is over and somebody comes to take it away, they go, oh, no, 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 no wait, 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 wait. <laughs> because they have already developed a sense of ownership. All right. Um, now we have to learn a philosophical concept because we're returning from this childish stuff to serious <laughs> stuff, namely to philosophy. Transparency is a philosoph philosophical concept and it means that you have a conscious representation but the representation is transparent because you cannot experience it as a representation. This British philosopher in 1899 introduced this concept so the idea is that you can have a representation of this chair in consciousness, but because the representation is transparent, you think you just directly see a chair. You're a naive realist. You're completely unaware of the fact that this is going on in your brain right now. So what is a transparent self-model? It's an integrated representation of the organism as a whole. It's not a thing, neither a thing in the brain, nor a representation of a thing in some other world, but it's an ongoing dynamic process in your brain, tracking global features which you have as an organism, features you only have as a, have as a whole. And in our own case, for angels this could be different. You use an integrated body model, and the properties of that body model are globally available. That's just another way of saying they are conscious. Conscious is what is available for everything, but you cannot attend to the construction process in the brain. So just like this naive realistic perception of the chair you have right now, you don't see that this is a model in your brain because you cannot attend to the construction process. It's so fast that it is ready and you just think, I see the chair. So I think to understand what a transparent self-model is, is one of the most exciting evolutionary, um, uh, uh, exciting projects in evolutionary <coughs> psychology right now. If you want to read more, the shortest publicly available um, summary is a four-page um, encyclopedia <coughs> entry in Scholarpedia, freely available on the internet. And there's this absolutely unreadable book with MIT Press called Being No One, which was already mentioned. Uh, it's horrible. So what is transparency? It's a visual meta metaphor. You don't see the window, but you only see the bird flying by in front of the window, right? You don't see the neurons firing away in your brain, but only what they represent for us. You don't see the neurons in your brain you see what they represent, a blue chair. You are unaware of the medium through which information reaches us. Consciousness is a medium. It's like emptiness or the empty space. And most of us are unaware of the medium. We are just thinking, well, this is a lecture hall and I'm sitting here. It's not. Up there is <coughs> not the sky. Up there is the bottom of your skull, right? To put it very bl bluntly and falsely. Uh, so conscious states, I think, are mostly but not always transparent. Why are they transparent? Because they are activated so fast that our attentional system cannot penetrate into the construction process. You just look there, pop, the model of the chair is there. That's one empirical hypothesis. Another one is that in evolution, in a much longer time window, there has no, been no selection pressure on our brains against naive realism. What does that mean? It was not necessary for our ancestors to know there's a tiger model active in my brain right now. <laughs> what they needed to know was there's a tiger out there. Uh, to have a model of, oh, I have a tiger model active in my brain right now, is computationally much more demanding. You need to burn more glucose and sugar for it. So if you don't need it, better go without it. This is why all of you think today that you're just sitting in a lecture hall. But if you think about it for a, a minute, what your physics teacher has told you in school, there are no colored objects in the world. 
right? They are just wavelength mixtures in front of your eyes. Most animals on this planet don't see color. The blueness and the blackness is a property of the model of the chair your brain constructs. Because it's transparent, you have the feeling, well, there's a chair out there. You don't have the experience, there's a chair model in my brain. Now here's the only decide I want to make in this lecture. I would claim we are systems which are not able to recognize their self-model as a model. You cannot consciously experience that the self-model active in your brain right now is a model, just with the change. Therefore, you operate under something that you might call a naive realistic self-misunderstanding. That's just a metaphor. We constantly confuse ourselves with the content of this image of ourselves in the brain. We are naive realists about our own self-model, uh, and that is why we necess necessarily experience ourselves not only as being in direct contact with reality, the chair, the floor, but as in direct contact with ourselves. <coughs> uh, by necessity, we must have the feeling that the content of the self-model is directly given to me. There is a phenomenology <coughs> of immediacy. I just look there, this is me, it's my body. And there's a phenomenology of identification. Think of the rubber hand illusion and the full body illusions. I identify with this body. <coughs> that is because of the model being transparent. So you get a specific conscious experience, not blueness or blackness, but the experience of, as some philosophers have said, being infinitely close to yourself, being directly in touch, of identifying with this because of the transparency of the self model. We're already coming to the end. So the simple argument is any system that has a conscious self model which is transparent will have a conscious experience of selfhood. There you will, just like blueness appears, have the experience of I am someone. So just a general idea, any conscious system that operates under a transparent self-model will necessarily experience itself as being someone. What we call the conscious self at the beginning, scientifically speaking, it's the representational content of a transparent self-model in your brain. It's whatever this model represents, if you identify it, you have a conscious self with that content. So, didn't I want to explain why the self is not an illusion? Ah, here's the paper. I wanted to explain why the self is not an illusion. So the point I've just made is you can explain everything about self-consciousness in the sense of selfhood without assuming selves. Much more parsimoniously with a transparent self-model. I don't know about in India, but in Germany, um, the following thing will now happen. Everybody will say, ah, yes, I've read that in a New Age bookstore. Uh, this guru, that guru, Buddhist, everybody says the self is an illusion. Uh, that's good science then. These, somehow these are good guys. Um, it's compatible with uh, what I want to believe. But if you look at it from a more strictly rigorous logical perspective, to say that the self is an illusion uh, is a logical mistake. Because an illusion is only something someone can have, right? But at the level we're talking, self-models in the brain, there isn't even, there's no little man there that could know something or could be wrong about something. There's not even an illusion. So if you wanted to stay with the sexy new age illusion metaphor, you know, pop Buddhism or something like that, then you would have to say that the self is an illusion that is nobody's illusion. I think that's enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We have uh, some time for a few questions. Uh, request to questioners. Questions have to be brief.
and have to be questions. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take to two so far. And, so, uh, and, and hopefully one question per person. So okay, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll you know, couple those in one. So uh, my question is that uh, what is your views about, uh, first of all, it's not clear what is, where do you line the draw between self and consciousness and what is your view about, uh, you know, like notions like a pan-conscious and Robert Lanza and, you know, uh, those kind of people, David Chalmers kind of notion. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, the second thing is that if you, uh, you're talking about this uh, uh, embodied notions of self, then, uh, then uh, how about this, uh, you know, Kurzweilian notions like, you know, mind uploading and because, I mean, do they have a, if, if that kind of thing, what is your opinion about them? And if that happens, then will they have a different kind of phenomenon self then in that case? Well, I thought, just the next, last point about uploading, I thought you would have realized this. There are all these Americans who talk about uploading an artificial immortality and make money with it. And they talk, but we do it. In Europe, we do it. <laughs> but that's just the point um, at the side. So many, West, <laughs> many, many Western philosophers uh, would say, because they don't have much of an imagination, uh, there cannot be consciousness without self-consciousness. But I think in India, it should be obviously to everybody that consciousness without self-consciousness is possible. There's also consciousness without color. Some people are colorblind. So uh, I think <coughs> to solve the problem of consciousness uh, and to solve the problem of self-consciousness are two different scientific issues. But one is very important for the other because Consciousness is not one problem. Uh, philosophically and scientifically, it's many problems. But the deepest problem is, is why is it subjective? Dave Chalmers and people will have very sophisticated arguments why it cannot be reductively explained, because it's essentially subjective. To explain when and why consciousness is subjective, you need a theory about the conscious self. For most people, Consciousness is always tied to an individual first-person perspective, a me having the experience of the chair. And that is what I've been interested in for many years, what is a first-person perspective. And that is why I get to the, how I get to this strange place. So, it's just, it's, it's subject, I said, a subject, subject, the object is there. Yeah. But always I feel strongly that object creates the subject. So is it true or is it the subject creates the object because I am there I am seeing or because that is there I am I'm, I come to exist. Yes. What exactly is the truth in it? Well there are different states of consciousness and there are also states of consciousness without the subject object distinction but I think the interesting fact is that it always emerges together. As soon as you look at the chair in a way that makes it an object like put it under a concept and you remember chair, then in the same moment a subject, a knowing self, a thinking self re-emerges. So I think um, there are very rare cases where you only have objects but no subject. And very rare cases where you only have a subject representation and no objects. It is actually a double, the structure of duality, you know, it emerges together. and. Uh, Maybe it's not even a meaningful question what is first, the object or the subject. I think it is one structure, the, the, the seeing self bound to the visual object for instance. The question is of course, can you see a chair in a way that there is no subject? Well, is that possible as well? In your scheme of thinking, uh, where is the dream state? Where is the meditative state? Uh, how, how does it fit into the framework that you... Well, if you drop my name into Google and you find my English homepage, you will find the last paper I've published is called Why Are Dreams Interesting for Philosophers? It's a paper on dream research. It's open access. You can just download it. In my group, we've, I've always been very interested in dream research. And I'm also a long-term meditator. I meditate for 37 years every morning, every evening regularly. But I've kept this more to my private life, uh, although I follow meditation research. 
dream research, modern dream research is very interesting because it is a contrast condition to waking, condition, uh, waking consciousness and you can do, as we have done, there are also publications, compare the dream self to the waking self. And if you look at the self model in the dream state and the self model in the waking state, there are many differences. For instance, I don't know if you've noticed, you cannot control your attention in the dream state. So then, there are a lucid dreaming kind of thing. Right. So then there are important transitions. You can look uh, what happens to the self model in the transition from an ordinary <coughs> dream to a lucid dream. I'm very proud, as a philosopher, I've demanded that we need to know the neural correlate of lu dream lucidity and that there are two German researchers, young people, Martin Dresler and Ursula Voss, who've just found the area in the brain that lights up when a subject in a dream lab becomes lucid. This leads to another interesting question. Are you lucid right now? Is there lucid waking? In a lucid dream, you, you know that you are dreaming right now. Do you really know that you are awake right now? <laughs> Or are you just sitting in a lecture hall and follow a discussion? So this leads on, so you can distinguish different levels in the self model and if one scientifically evaluates dream reports from sleep labs, one finds that the self model in the dream state is very different. For instance, there are no warmth and cold sensations. Maybe you've realized this, now you have a feeling of temperature. In the dream body, you don't have warm and cold. Also, statistically, pain sensations in the dream body. Often there's not, not really all the legs are there and the fingers. It's more like a wave moving sensation. And so on and so on. So if you compare the self model in the dream state with the waking self model, you learn a lot. And one of the most shocking things is, is that you can have what philosophers call unnoticed rationality deficits. That is, in the dream state, you can have the most bizarre delusional beliefs and come to com completely false conclusions and are mistaken about uh, identity of person. Somebody can be Venu and your mother at the same time and you never realize it. And the moment you wake up from the dream state, uh, ah, okay, I just here's some info. There's a free on online paper you might uh, like. And this is the popular book. So um, there are these different layers in the self model and you can be completely delusional and irrational in the dream state and never notice it. And that is very interesting because if that's possible in the dream state, it could also be possible right now. Right? So how do we know in the waking state that we may not have some completely irrational beliefs sometimes without being able to notice the fact that is one of the things I've learned from dream research. Um, is, that, is that why uh, probably it coincides with everything it is in the state of vibration? Buddha said, by the time I blink my eyes, the whole existence appears and disappears a million times. Yes. Where in Turiya state, the observed and the observer become a single. Yes. Uh, is, that, is that explained by this? Well, these are just the very beginnings, but of course it would be very interesting if these things were not a matter of the authority of scripture, but if they could be shown in a scientific way as well. And one thing, one of many things science shows, I don't know if it's trillions, <laughs> but the, the processes that make up, for instance, the model of the chair or the model of yourself in the brain are ultra-fast, they're os oscillating. But you cannot consciously experience this flicker, so to speak. You just have the stable model of the chair at the end. So the prediction would be that somebody who has developed his attention very deeply suddenly would not see the chair as a chair anymore but as a very fast flickering pattern, for, in for instance. But normally, it's not like that. And, I mean, if I may add one, yes? No, on that I have a question. See, the, uh, 
uh, robotics is, uh, you know, it's macroscopic mechanics. Yes. I mean, you have processing of uh, primarily visual uh, data, whereas the neural correlates are more driven by molecular biology. I mean, you just said, you trillions of fast processes. So how reliable is it to, to derive conclusions from by robotics? Um, I don't think one can derive very strong conclusions from this. I just use this as an illustration for what I mean by a self-model. A machine can have a self-model, and of course it doesn't have molecular dynamics in the brain. It's much cruder. Um, also, it's not clear, I mean, this machine has not evolved everything of itself. Why should it walk? Why should it try to have a good self-model? There are many things that still have been put in top down by the roboticists. Uh, it's not truly evolutionary. In our own history, it was just those systems that didn't have a good cell phone, they just died. They had no children uh, until someone got it right. Um, so yes, maybe it's not clear, you know. It's not clear what the set of properties is that determine consciousness. It could be molecular properties on membranes of neurons, although I don't believe it. It could be properties of millions of neurons doing something together. What the level of explanation is, we just don't know. We are at the very beginning. But a machine, I think, helps on the abstract level, on the software level, to get a functional analysis. But <coughs> a functional analysis is limited. I think you're absolutely right. If it is molecular dynamics in the brain, self-organizing dynamics, you will never have a machine model. The modern medical science, the depth of the brain, what happens to the conscious life energy in the body? Yeah, I don't know what life energy is. You see, this is, strictly speaking, it's a metaphorical use. A physicist can define what energy means. But life energy, it's not only prana. I mean, in, in Western tradition, we also have the idea of a life energy. But nobody has been able to show that something like this exists. That's the problem. Is there enough that shows? Excuse me. One. Anybody else? So, uh, in neuroscience, do we have a general agreement? Like, uh, when is the stage that uh, this concept of self develops? Uh, like, is it, uh, do we work on that? Like, do we work on the child consciousness, adult consciousness, and like, but don't forget, I'm a philosopher. I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> so I know not as much as you may uh, think. But I give you an interesting example um, about misunderstandings of what I learned as a philosopher from neuroscientists. You remember that woman without arms and legs and the front of limbs? I said, that's the proof that there's an inborn template for the body model. There must be a genetic, you know, matrix for the body model. Uh, and so it's like an innate idea of the self that may be passed on, and then we can look in childhood. And then these clever neuropsychologists said, no, it's not clear. There are mirror neurons where you mirror other bodily behavior. This poor girl born without arms and legs had an extremely <coughs> strong motivation to have a complete body. Her whole visual input from baby on was other complete bodies. When she was trying to understand her mother and so forth, she was always representing complete bodies in her brain. And maybe she could have, so to speak, booted or constructed her own body model from visual perception of her social environment. So maybe there is not anything innate at birth. And from all I know, we just don't know that. <coughs> Quick question. You know, would you say that your own uh, uh, self model is not transparent, having gone through this, you know, the, the idea that it can't be transparent? So it seems well, the story is a bit more complicated. First, let me make a more general point, which I think is, should be very interesting. Uh, uh, especially in this country, I am forced to make an empirical <coughs> prediction. If I say the sense of selfhood is created by the transparency of the self-model, any system that would make its whole self-model opaque, that is the opposite of transparent, experience it as a representation, 
would lose the sense of selfhood. That's a prediction I must make. If the self model becomes opaque, it say somebody in meditation developed its attentional processing to such a fine degree that they could penetrate into the construction process of the self model, it would become an image uh, and something that is not a given reality. The second thing is, I think what differentiates us from most animals, what has made us so successful, is that our self-model is not completely transparent. Not all of it, the body model is transparent. But for instance, when you consciously think thoughts, you, your conscious experience is, I operate with representations of the world which could be true or false. There you are not a naive realist. So the chimpanzee maybe has a little bit of that in their self model, but I think what makes us <coughs> unique is that we have a section that is not transparent and we can represent ourselves as representing. Whereas I think most animals are completely <coughs> caught in the here and now and in this self model and they cannot distance it, themselves from it. But we have this ability to look at ourselves from the outside, at least a little bit, at least sometimes. We can see that we are thinking that, that these thoughts might be false representations. And that's very important. An interesting question is the emotional level. I don't know. Emotions are not always transparent. You, know, you, you have this feeling, um, yeah, I just see my wife is cheating me. You know, in jealousy, you have this emotion, I see this out there, it's transparent. Then you suddenly become aware, um, maybe I have a problem, maybe it is something in me, and you see that you have an emotional representation. So I think the body model is always completely realistic. In thinking, you realize that you are representing, and there's interestingly also something in between. No, the question, my question was, as you know, you've come at this not as a meditator, if I put it that way. You come at this, uh, okay, let's say you come at, I mean, at least yeah. part of you that we are seeing is yes, that good. of, a, <laughs> that of a, a, you know, a, let's say, a rigorous scientist. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, the process of uh, sort of more ontologically experiencing uh, yes. the no self is, is one group. Yeah, yeah. You, have, you have kind of epistemologically come at the same question, if I want to put it that way. Yes. So has that changed your uh, the ontological or the experiential sense of yourself? Well, that's the best answer. Almost not at all. Uh, <laughs> it, it, many philosophers have tried to think themselves out of their self. It's a very robust thing. It has been optimized by millions of years by evolution. You know, it's just, uh, I mean, it has done some things to me, of course. One thing to give you an example is I have studied very, very carefully um, psychiatric case studies, people with different kinds of mental illness and schizophrenia because that's also an important question. What is the self-model of the schizophrenic, of the deluded patient? How does it break apart? This has changed me um, because I've become aware how fragile my self-model is and how at any moment this can turn into a tragedy, a blood vessel explodes your brain and your self model is completely different. So that, but um, isn't that this tradition of uh, Inyana Yoga or so, just by pure intellect? Um, I don't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't change much. So say, uh, what, yeah, I'm afraid that we have to. As a philosopher, what is your idea about theology? About theology? Yeah. Ah, well. It's a discipline that has no object and no methodology. <laughs> uh, so the problem is <laughs> if you should, uh, I mean, I can say this here. I cannot say this at my home university, which is a Catholic university. The question is if you should spend tax money for it. Um, there's, of course, really comparative religious studies. There are important things, you know, about the history of religion and comparing different traditions. But in the literal sense of the word, a discipline, an academic discipline that has to do with knowledge of God, um, I think that is intellectually dishonest. There can just be no such thing. I'm afraid that we have to stop. 
thank you very much all of you who came here today and thanks to Professor Metzinger for a very engaging talk.